Um, um, as I said, I, I went to college in Alton. I lived in the local area. Um, the, the, it's where I really cut my teeth in terms of um, studying battlefields. At the time um, that I was down in Alton uh, studying college, um, it was uh, it was a I was a hobby um, when I should have been doing my studies. I was walking the battlefield, and uh, it's a hobby that's that's gone out of control. Um, it's now how I make my bread and butter. But there we go. Alton as a battle, okay, should be better remembered. Um, it fills all the criteria to be included on the. Uh, the UK battlefields uh, register, it's not included on it. That might be because of uh, the fact that, that it's been incorporated uh, by urban modern planning uh, that's subsumed the battlefield. Um, it might be for other reasons. It might be because there's not been any archeology span found um, on the site. Um, but it's not been included on, on, on the UK battlefields register. Um, it may well be because it's been overshone uh, by its large, larger counterparts, uh, the Battle of Cheriton, fought uh, three months after the battle in March of 1644. Um, but whatever the case that might be, okay, we need to remember the Battle of Alton. It is significant, if not only for the, uh, for the Civil War in Hampshire, and certainly for the wider royalist strategy moving forward uh, into 1644. And indeed, when I was studying it all the way back in you know, 10, 15 years ago, um, if you want to know anything about the battle, okay, the information was not there. Um, it would usually be incorporated as footnotes okay, in one or two books. In recent years, okay, we've had a, you know, a bit of a, a sea change um, in terms of uh, the amount of uh, literature being brought out about the Civil War, um, and certainly within the last year, the amount of material that's been republished or has been newly published about the Civil War in Hampshire um, has gone through the roof. I mean, we only have to look at um, BBC History's Book of the Year uh, for this year being the Siege of Loyalty House, the siege of, uh, you know, based on the, the, the Siege of Basing House by J.C. Childs, that understands that uh, the civil war in Hampshire is growing in prominence in terms of public perception. But Alton remember, remains uh, to be forgotten. Okay, it doesn't have its own book by itself, and certainly that's something uh, that needs to be needs to be addressed. And uh, what we will do uh, during the course of the evening um, is go through the strategic background as to why the battle actually had to happen, uh, why uh, the uh, how that battle was actually fought and the ultimate aftermath and impact that the battle has on the wider expanse of the Civil War. So, next slide, please. Next slide. Hello. James. Next slide, please. Hello. Sorry, I just unmuted That's myself. Right. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. Thanks. The next slide's up, uh, Warwick. It is. Up. Okay, fantastic. So I don't need to tell you, okay, where, where Alton is. Okay, you live closer to it than I do. Um, Alton, okay, is, is, is pivotal. Um, it's equidistant between Portsmouth and London, Southampton, and, uh, and Salisbury as well. Uh, it acts as a hinge point within Hampshire um, for, uh, for the, the, the impact of the war. Next slide, please. Uh, James, I regret that we're, st we're still just seeing the initial slide. Um, I wonder whether, it, well, in computer terms, you might have lost focus, i.e. your cursor is somewhere else. So what I suggest is you, Point at, point at the picture that you think you're you're showing, and then try the the, the right the the right arrow. That might that often fixes it for me when I've had this issue. Sorry, well, um, we're still on the first slide. Is that better? Uh, not yet, but it's it does take a little while to come through. How strange. 
Um, I'm wondering whether it's worth stopping sharing and starting again. Okay. It's worth a try. Um, can you can you see that now? Uh, no, no, afraid not. Uh, no, nothing's moved. Okay, I'll I'll close the whole thing down and start again. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Can you see that? It's on its yep. way. Yeah. So you're in presentation. You're you're in uh, edit mode. Um, okay. Can you see that? That's the first yep. screen. Yeah. Can you see that? The second. Uh, yeah. That's yep. it. That's brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if you could make go on to the next slide, please. Fantastic. Now, in reality, um, there have been four battles of Alton. Um, the first is in 1001 uh, between the Anglo-Saxons and Vikings during the succession war between Athelred and uh, Connacht. Um, it is a victory for the Danes. Uh, the English lost 81, uh, including two Reeves and two Fanes, although the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle does report uh, that the Danes lost twice as many um, as the English. Um, after this, the Danes advanced west uh, while the English fell back on Winchester. We do, though, have to uh, put some doubt as to whether uh, the battle, as it is named in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, in their words, Athlingdean, actually happened around Al Alton. If you break down the word Athlingdean, Athling meaning prince, Dean meaning valley, so the valley of the prince, that may well refer to the, uh, the, the, the manor of the House of Wessex that stood around Alton. It may also equally refer uh, to the manor uh, of the family of Wessex uh, in and around West Dean in West Sussex as well. So we can't be sure uh, that the battle fought in 1001 directly happened around Alton. But between the storming of the town on the 13th of December 1643, there are other battles that happen in and around Alton as well. And we'll look at that in detail um, as we go on. Next slide, please. In terms of the Civil War, the first fighting that occurs in Alton uh, happens uh, within February of 1643. It's an encounter battle. Um, a, a squadron of 200 parliamentarian horse uh, ride into the town uh, and try and get quarter for the night. What they are surprised to find is that Prince Rupert's regiment of 1,500 horse um, was garrisoning the town. And there's a battle that goes right the way down the, down the high street. Um, the parliamentarians have brought with them um, a, a small uh, field piece uh, called a Robinet, firing about a two pound ball, tiny little gun. Um, and the new sheep say they fired a partridge shot, what we would know as, as a grape shot, uh, musket balls tied together in a muslin bag, fired out the cannon and acts a bit like a shotgun down the high street. And they take out about 80 of Prince Rupert's hordes. Initially repulsed, he then charges in again, loses another 40 royalists. Uh, as well. Now, whether these numbers are, are accurate, the news sheets do have a tendency to inflate numbers in order to sell paper. We don't really know, but certainly all through the uh, all through the afternoon, um, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the royalists charged uh, the parliamentarian um, dismounted horse get pushed back again until the onset of night, uh, when gradually the parliamentarians are forced back out of the town um, and they escape towards Waller at Guildford. They leave their, their piece of artillery behind them. Next slide, please. But these have all been isolated incidents. By the winter of 1643, the Civil War was at a stalemate. Um, in the north, the uh, Marcus of Newcastle was bogged down around Hull, removing the possibility of leading his army south in support um, of the King's Oxford Army in the home counties. And so by doing that as well, also 
meaning that the coal supply that was under dispute at this time in the north, that could not be brought down to the king's army, meaning that the issue of powder to fire cannons, to fire muskets off, um, they had a shortage of that as well. And that's a big problem. As well as that, um, the, the signing uh, with Parliament and the Scots of the Solemn League and Covenant, uh, the anniversary of which is today the Scots marching south, um, the threat of invasion uh, from Scotland loomed very threatening on, threateningly on the horizon for the Royalists as well. As well as that, the King's Oxford army had failed that summer during the Royalist summer, string of victories, but they had failed to take Gloucester, removing free passage of troops from Ireland and Wales as well across the Seven Sea. Next slide, please. And in September, they had also failed to break through to London, uh, being uh, fought against at Newbury by the Earl of Essex uh, in September as well. Next slide, please. In the South in July, Waller had been utterly defeated at Ramway Down. Um, and this has left Bristol completely undefended, allowing his good friends and the opposing commander on the Royalist side, Sir Ralph Hopton, uh, to take Bristol. Um, the campaign then moving forward into 1644 was largely to subjugate London in a pincer movement, with Lord Byron coming from Wales um, with Irish troops hoping to encircle London, while Sir Ralph Hopton would advance on London from the West Country and Hampshire as well. Next slide, please. Key to the story of the, of the early civil war in Hampshire is the rivalry and friendship uh, between the two composing, uh, two opposing commanders. If any of you joined us uh, last May for the, uh, the walk around Cheriton, uh, you would have recognized, of course, uh, these two characters. Uh, on the left, the uh, parliamentarian commander, Sir William Waller, and on the right, uh, Royalist commander, Sir Ralph Hopton. Now, Waller had been born in 1598, the son of Sir Thomas Waller, the deputy governor of Dover, and moving forward uh, in 1618, had enlisted in Peyton's foot in the service of Venice and had seen service at the Siege of Rubia. In 1619, he transfers to Swedish service under the Veers Regiment, and it's here that he serves along luminaries such as Hopton and also the Earl of Essex as well. In 1620, he, along with Hopton, had served in Elizabeth, the Winter Queen's, the sister of Charles I's uh, bodyguard uh, on a retreat out of Bohemia uh, during the Dutch Revolt. He returns to England in 1638 and he's made uh, a justice of the peace and the keeper of Winchester Castle. But his involvement in Parliament doesn't really come about until the, the very dawn of the Civil War uh, in 1641, when he's made MP for Andover, uh, possibly as a reward for raising money for the King uh, for putting down the Irish Rebellion as well. At the breaking out of the Civil War, uh, he's immediately appointed as uh, uh, a member of the Committee of, of Safety, and he also serves under, uh, uh, as second in command of the Parliamentarian Army uh, besieging Portsmouth. With his Overall commander, Lord George Goring, changing sides during the siege. Uh, he goes on to take Chichester and then in command of the Western Association, takes Portsmouth, Farnham. Uh, his regiment is routed at Edge Hill before he's fought to a stalemate and lands down and loses at the Battle of Ramway Down. Now he is a Puritan. Um, he judges his performance on the battlefield as holy judgment. He's very much a constitutional monarchist. He ums and ahs before the Civil War as to which side to go. But his moderate politics uh, purely place him uh, within the parliamentarian camp. And because of his way of campaigning, he likes to uh, humbug and he likes to uh, use night marches and surprise tactics. He gains the Sopricate, uh, the Night Owl and the William and William the Conqueror. And, and of course, you know, going forward into Alton, uh, Alton is a, is a prime example of him using uh, such tactics as well. Hopton, on the other hand, on the right, um, he's born in 1596, so he's a bit, young, uh, bit younger than Waller. Um, he studied at Oxford before transferring to Veer's regiment uh, in Farg, where he eventually gets raised to the, the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. In 1625, he returns and he becomes the MP for Bath. And prior to the Civil War, um, he'd actually opposed uh, the King's unconstitutional rule and been one of the lead delegates that had presented the grand remonstrance, the uh, list of, of grievances um, against the king and his councillors 
uh, to Charles I as well. Um, however, at the start of the war, because he's again umming and arming, he is imprisoned, um, is released on taking up the commission of array for Somerset, promptly changes sides and commands the King's armies in the West. And these two people, they, they've got a long standing relationship, uh, they've got a long standing friendship. Um, they are on relatively good terms. And indeed, if we look at the correspondence between the two, um, it shows that despite you know, going up against each other and campaigning against each other, um, that is a friendship um, that lasts the rigors uh, of the Civil War. Next slide, please. So the campaign opens on the 13th of September, 1643. Waller returns to London um, after his defeat at Bramway Down uh, to impress uh, amid a parliamentarian man manpower shortage, a new army to secure the West Country and Hampshire. And amongst the London boroughs, he's, he's taking every 18 to 50 year old to march to the drum. Um, and this would be largely made up of river boatmen and reformado officers, officers without a regiment who take lower ranks uh, in order to fill out the manpower uh, within uh, these units. There is a quick power struggle though that does develop uh, over the emphasis uh, for the campaigning season uh, in late 1643 and 44. Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, wants to Im uh, immediately isolate Oxford and therefore secure London, bring the war to a swift, quick close. On the other hand, Waller wants to isolate Southern England uh, and therefore place a stranglehold on Bristol, removing the threat of soldiers coming across from Ireland and Wales uh, and Basinghouse as well. There's also a bit of a personal bent uh, to why Waller wants to fight this way he wants retribution against Hockton uh, for his defeat at Brownway Down as well. So he forms a base at Farnham and uh, he immediately starts taking outlying towns around Basing, uh, thus protecting his communication links along the A30 between Salisbury and London. But this is immediately put into jeopardy in October when Sir William Ogle takes Winchester for the Royalists. Now, as a bit of a re knee jerk re reaction to try and isolate Winchester and hold his position, uh, Waller takes Andover on the 28th of October, uh, thus isolating uh, Winchester. Ne uh, next slide, please. Now, during this, this uh, you know, toing and throwing, small skirmishing between both sides, more fighting comes to Alton. Um, the second battle, fought on the 2nd of November, uh, 1643, we don't actually know very much about it. It sounds like a beating up action. So Waller coming into Alton uh, to basically harass the Wallace forces um, in the town. We know he attacks Sir Humphrey Bennett's 500 horse. There is no record uh, anywhere that I can find as to the outcome uh, of that fighting. We can only presume as Hopton later moves into the town uh, that Waller is forced back out again. Next slide, please. Between the 6th and the 14th of November, Waller then invests Basing, hoping to control the main London road, uh, while also removing the threat of a fifth column in his rear should he go for Winchester. The siege, though, fails due to bad weather and the London train bans mutiny, um, so much so that during one attempt at storming the house, um, uh, units in front of them, the, uh, the London train bands not recognizing who they are, they are a friendly unit, fire into the back of them and then run away shouting out home, home. They're pretty unhappy with the fact that they've been in the field for about the last six months, away from their homes, away from their businesses. Um, they want to go home. Um, they feel they're being taken advantage of. It's also not helped by the fact that Hopton very quickly is on the scene and he relieves the garrison of the house as well, forcing Waller to fall back on Farnham. Next slide, please. Hopton, of course, is not going to keep, uh, is not going to take this sitting down. And on the 28th of November, he attempts uh, to try and take Farnham. Um, the fighting, if it had happened, uh, would have happened in the golf course just below Farnham Castle. Um, it, it ends in a bit of a stalemate. Um, no fighting happens. They stare each other down. And Hopton, now realizing that Waller's not going to be drawn out, not going to be mad enough to campaign throughout the winter season. Um, moves himself into winter quarters. Now his quarters are going to be stretched over about 30 miles between Odium and Petersfield. Um, different brigades going into different towns, thus making sure that they can be equally supplied and he can hold this, uh, this uh, communication line uh, along the Way Valley as well. 
So Hopton's personal brigade is uh, based uh, out of Winchester. Sir John Vavasor is at, at Alversford. Sir John Berkeley's at Petersfield. And then Sir Jacob Astley's foot and Lord Forfer's horse are going to be based centrally at Alton as well. Now you can see that the, uh, that the dispositions of the Royalist Army stretched over about 30 miles. That's not a good thing. Between Winchester and Alton, it's 17 miles. If an assault is, get, is made upon the town, any relieving force is not going to get there until the fighting is well and truly over. So that is a big problem. The advantages of putting yourself and disposing yourself in this manner is that you immediately control accesses to the rivers Way, Itchen and Test. Um, and by putting himself in these positions, it also threatens Waller's communications to London as well. However, the Royalist Army knew full well, OK, that putting themselves into this position, it was a weak position to be in. Colonel Joseph Bamfield relates that on present at the War Council, declared his opinion that it was dangerous to divide the army into so many open quarters. Well, Sir William Wallace remained in one entire body, since he could in one night, as his custom was to march, force any of the nearest to him before the others could be advertised, join and succumb the quarter attacked. This coming from a very young man was neglected as of no moment, and it was to their detriment uh, at moving forward um, that he had such foresight as well. Next slide, please. Defences started in earnest. From the 1st of December, Hopton created a series of defended stop lines around Winchester, including Borden, Oliver's Battery, Werewolf Priory, and Islington. And such defences, while protecting Royalist lines of communication, also protected the potential route into Sussex via Midhurst. Around Alton as well, defences were started um, and other potential garrison towns at weak spots in that line, uh, earthworks were put up around them as well. Uh, to try and mitigate any assault that might be made upon them. Next slide, please. And if you want to click again. There we go. Meanwhile, at All Saints Church in Trondle, um, Parliament had set up an outpost uh, watching the Royalist sign. Next slide, please. From here, Wallace Scoutmaster, Colonel John Birch, received news from Cornet Mevan, who was a spy within, Prince of, within the Prince of Wales horse, uh, based in Alton. Um, he gained knowledge uh, of the disposition of Hopton's defences. And as such, Waller decided, being his nature, not fighting by the conventional rules of, of war, uh, he was going to start picking away at this line uh, to see what Hopton would do. Next slide, please. On the 2nd of December, Hopton also advanced into West Sussex and he immediately takes Arundel um, after, after investing it. Uh, and by taking Arundel, not only does he gain access to the Wheeled Iron Foundries, good for manufacturing uh, shot and, and cannon, uh, but he also gained control of Sussex as well. And that would be a fertile recruiting ground uh, while also threatening Southampton as well. On the 9th of September, Wallace starts to pick away and see what Hopton's going to do. So his first move is to, again, beat up Crawford's quarters at Alton, but again, he's forced back as well. On the 11th, Colonel Richard Norton, uh, the nephew of Oliver Cromwell, he also uh, uh, moves into Romsey, beats up the Wallace quarters there, and by doing this, Hopton is drawn away from Winchester as well. Next slide, please. Now, during the fighting at Alton, Sir Humphrey Bennett uh, captured a parliamentarian officer and under interrogation, the officer provided information that Waller had received recruits from London the previous day. Now, believing this was a sign Waller was mobilizing to campaign through the winter season, Hopton struggled to concentrate his forces at Winchester. And indeed, he sent out information and intelligence to Lord Crawford and his second in command, Colonel Richard Bowles, at Alton, basically saying, look, you're not in, in enough strength at Alton. If Waller tries to attempt it, um, you do not have to hold the town, pull back to safety, and we'll take the town again at a different time as well. The problem is that intelligence did not get to Crawford until about 11 o'clock the day before the storming of the town. And so naturally, there's only so much he could have actioned as well. 
Next slide, please. Now, as well as this, um, one of the more amusing tales of the battle is that on the 12th of December, uh, Lord Crawford sent a messenger to Waller, basically asking him to send him a run of, scat of sack in return for an ox. Um, basically, cocky a snooper at, at Waller. Waller sent the wine, but Crawford uh, refused the ox and uh, challenged Waller instead to fetch it and sell. Basically, you know, his version of, you think you're hard enough, come and get it, basically. Next slide, please. Now, such an exchange may also have been used by Waller uh, to, uh, to basically scout out Forford's dispositions. And judging that the Royalists were only defending the line of the A31, uh, looking in one direction, Waller decided by coming out of the town from the other direction, uh, from the northwest, he could attack the town. And so he mustered his forces in Farnham Park at seven o'clock uh, in the evening on the 12th of December. Now, he used this opportunity to once again address the London train bands, who are once again mutants. And he thanks him, them for their service. They've, they've been in the field for six months. They've, they've done all that has been asked of them. But he does allow them the chance to leave on the proviso that if they stayed, they could regain the honour uh, lost at Basing. And so they're allowed to go into the town, bring in supplies, uh, say goodbye to any loved ones within the town. And almost to a man, uh, they return to the colours. Next slide, please. So, 12 o'clock, uh, 12 o'clock midnight uh, on the 13th of December. Waller marches west and uh, two miles at, all sh at U Shop. If you just want to press the button again, James. So, it's just gone back to the previous slide. Thank you. Okay. Um, he changes direction at U Shop uh, to mislead any Royalist scouts, any Royalist pickets out watching. Uh, watching Farnham. At one o'clock, uh, he's marching through fields cross country, um, roughly parallel to the A287 uh, to Alton. And the, uh, what not, uh, the news books and the accounts of the battle do say uh, that there is a heavy frost uh, masking uh, the sound of their advance as well. What Waller has also done in the previous day, he has sent out pioneers ahead of his line, uh, to cut holes through hedges, uh, cut down any woodland that's going to uh, impede his approach uh, to Alton, uh, and so he's going to have a clear run uh, straight through to the town. Next slide, please. So if we look at the parliamentarian order of battle, they've got about five and a half thousand infantry, 500 dragoons, and 500 cavalry, and an artillery train of about three, uh, of about, around three pieces. So a small artillery train um, is definitely a raiding force. But if we look at it as well, most of those regiments are up to their full strength. Um, you know, they're, they're, um, they're pretty much based around the, uh, the London train bands as well. There is a, uh, a cohesion of command right there. It is an organized force. And their filled words, the, the password that they're going to identify friend from foe on the battlefield uh, is going to be truth and victory. Next slide, please. In comparison, the Royalist Army of the West uh, was depleted from the previous summer. Um, it's very much an army of detachments. Um, it's, it's pieced together. Um, certainly there's no synergy um, of, of identity in terms of, of regiments. They've been drawn from various garrisons, uh, from Reading, Oxford, Abingdon and Wallingford. Uh, and certainly uh, accounts uh, from the days before the storming of the town suggest there may well have been some bad uh, blood between uh, those soldiers in the army that were Welsh and the rest of the, uh, of the soldiers as well. It's going to be an emerging theme uh, of civil war battles that large amounts of soldiers did mistake uh, Welsh soldiers for Irish soldiers. Um, obviously, there's, there's uh, you know, long memories of the Irish rebellion going on in 1640 and 1641 as well. There's a bit of mistrust uh, between soldiers as well. But the garrison largely is, is numbering about 1,600 men, which is you know, a sizable amount. And they've got a force um, of about 500 cavalry as well. And their filled word on the battlefield is going to be Charles. So the garrison wakes up at nine o'clock in the morning to find that Waller has arrayed himself before the town. They've not been expecting this, apart from the intelligence that Hopton has said uh, the previous day. Um, he arrives to the west of Alton and he immediately takes six of Crawford's sentries prisoner. Next slide, please. 
Now, one sentry did manage to get back to Crawford in the center of the town, uh, and he, mustering his horse, tried to retreat off to the west, but found his way blocked by uh, parliamentarian cavalry under Sir Arthur Hesering. Next slide, please. A running battle ensued down Lenton Street to Market Street. Um, as you can see, although much of the housing there um, is modern, okay, uh, it will follow the, the 17th century street pattern. It is quite a narrow street to get down. And certainly if you're trying to array a, a, a regiment of cavalry down it, okay, you're gonna have trouble moving there as well. The sound down there, okay, would have been, you know, absolutely horrendous. Muskets firing, swords clattering off armor, um, it would have been you know, a very nasty place, very small place indeed as well. Crawford, in the process, loses about 200 men. Whether they're captured or whether, whether they're killed outright, we don't really know. Uh, none of the accounts um, make this clear. Uh, but he does manage to get away from House of Rig, escapes to, to Winchester, uh, and it gives Hopton the sad news, a little possibility of the relieving of the rest. He get, leaves the command of the garrison in the hands of Colonel Richard Bowles. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, Wallers, Hasselriggs, and Springate's Kentish Redcoats attacked uh, from uh, the west across the Greenfalls Estate and the Flood Meadows as well, heading up uh, towards where the library is today. Next slide, please. And that, their first port of call was Amory Hill Farm, which Garrison had, had uh, settled themselves in, and they were sniping the uh, the, the parliamentarian line as they went past. If you can just click to, there you go. Um, now, initially, the, uh, the, the parliamentarian attackers were repulsed, uh, and it was only at the bringing up of their artillery train, the lever guns, I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, that forced the garrison out. They fire a uh, partridge shot into the house, possibly set light to the, the roof, and uh, the, uh, the people that are in the house are forced back to the safety of St. Lawrence Churchill. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what are lever guns? Um, they've been developed uh, for the Swedish army as, as basically a regimental support weapon. Um, basically, it's slats of iron, okay, that are bound together with, with lever bands. The lever is shrunken and that holds the barrel together. So it's a cheap way of making an artillery piece. Sometimes they've got one uh, barrel, sometimes they've got two and um, they would fire a one or two pound shot, more likely they're get, again going to use um, a partridge shot to act as very much a, a, a small shotgun basically. But Waller has used these um, to attack Alton because if he brings anything bigger, uh, anything you know, like, a, like a saker or a mortar to, to bombard the town, uh, he's going to have trouble getting it through that rough country again as well. Remember as well that he, his army is still being resupplied uh, from uh, the previous summer, he'd lost his entire artillery train at uh, Roundway Down. Uh, it's taking time to resupply that train as well. So lever guns is his only real option. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, the London train bands and uh, Colonel Samuel Jones's Farnham Greencoats, the, the garrison of Farnham Castle, uh, advanced along the other end of Lenton Lane. And uh, isolated, the remaining garrison retreated into St. Lawrence Churchyard, uh, commanded by Colonel Richard Bowles. So it would have been running volleys, a firefight down that street again. And as you can see, uh, very, very narrow indeed. They may well have even been forced back by Pusher Pike, uh, but a very narrow place, okay, to try and deploy uh, large amounts of troops as well. Next slide, please. Now, an interlude at the moment, the hero of the, of, of the battle, if there is any, um, has to be uh, Colonel Richard Bowles. Um, now he's born in 1595. Um, by 1624, he had uh, enlisted as an ensign in uh, Sir per Peregrine Bertie's regiment in the Netherlands. He sees uh, action at the attack on Cadiz. He's uh, putting down uh, the rebels in Ireland during the uh, uh, during the, uh, the, 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 the the landed settlement there. Um, he serves under the Duke of Buckingham at uh, the Rochelle. Uh, and it's only in 1630 that he gets wounded and he returns back to England. In 1640, he re-enlists in uh, uh, Paget's regiment, uh, serves in the Bishop's Wars, fights at, at Newburn Ford on the Scots borders, and going forward into the Civil War, will fight at Edgehill, at the Siege of Reading and Bristol and Gloucester, and also at the Battle of Newbury as well. So he's a veteran, he knows what he's doing. Um, he's an old, an old war dog, basically. 
Next slide. So the garrison has now been forced back into the churchyard uh, around St. Lawrence Church. And Waller's regiment heads straight for them, um, assailing the, the hornwork to the north. Next slide, please. While the Green Regiment of the Westminster Le uh, London Train Bands uh, came around the flank to the southeast gate of the, of the churchyard and forced the Wallace out under the smoke uh, from the burning roof of Amory Hill Farm. Now, a firefight continues around the church for around, around two hours. And by this point, the garrison have fully ensconced themselves uh, through uh, in the church. They've smashed out the windows. They're firing from inside the church as well. And there would have been a, a pool of, of, of smoke. The roof of, of Amory Hill Farm may well have been thatched. So yellow smoke covering that battlefield as well. You wouldn't have been able to see, you know, more than 10, 20 yards in front of you as well. So it's become a bit of a fort uh, right in the middle of the town as well. Now, by 11 o'clock, the garrison were finally forced back, uh, possibly again at Pusher Pike, uh, from the church wall. Um, one account says, you know, suggesting that there has been more of a firefight going on, um, that the garrison has left their muskets sticking above the parapet uh, to confuse the parliamentarian attackers, thinking that they're possibly still defending that church wall um, as well. Now, one of the main accounts uh, for the battle um, is written by Lieutenant Ilias Archer, and he um, served uh, within the Green Regiment of the London Train Bands, and he says, we consulted among ourselves to enter two or three files of musketeers, promising Richard Guy, one of the captain's sergeants, to follow him if he would lead them. Whereupon he advanced, and coming within the churchyard door and seeing most of the cavaliers firing at our men, looked behind him. And there was only one, one musketeer with him. So whether that's, you know, the, the, that's an account of the rate of fire coming out from that church or simply that the storming party was, was too cowardly to follow him in, you know, take your pick. OK, it's completely up to you. Next slide, please. Firefight continues around the church until about two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, whereupon the parliamentarians start throwing grenades through the windows, uh, hoping to clear uh, the, 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 the defenders out of the church as well. The uh, Archer says again that the churchyard was full of our men, laying about them stoutly with halberts, swords and musket stocks, while some of them threw hand grenades in at the church windows. And during this period, about 10 to 12 uh, get killed in the churchyard, whether they're from the attacking parliamentarian force or whether it's from the garrison, we don't really know. Um, certainly some of the later Antiparian uh, Archaeology that's been done around the church did uncover uh, evidence of this fighting uh, quite clearly uh, to the north of the churchyard. Next slide, please. At this point, uh, Sergeant Major Shambrook uh, forced open the main doors, and uh, Archer calls him a man whose worth and valor envy cannot stain. Uh, but he's immediately shot in the thigh. Uh, left an Archer again. And coming in in a disorderly manner to the southwest corner of the church, with their pikes in the rear, their front was forced back on their own pikes, which hurt and wounded many of the men and break the pikes in pieces. And so naturally, OK, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the parliamentarian storming party is now resorted uh, to push of pike, uh, leveling their pikes at the defenders and basically going to a rugby scrum to try and force them out from, uh, from that doorway. Um, as I said, the, 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 the crush would have been so thick, okay, that, um, that the, those getting wounded or killed uh, would have been held up by, by the crush of, of pike staves um, left, right, and center. It, it would have been a bloody place uh, in a very, very small place indeed. Next slide, please. Amongst those storming the church is uh, Colonel Birch um, of Hazelrigg's regiment. We've, we've talked about him before. Um, he's wounded from a dry blow from a musket butt. He basically gets smacked in the face with the, with the back end of a musket. Uh, something to certainly ruin your day. Next slide, please. Gradually, uh, the parliamentarians forced the garrison back into the nave of the church. And uh, there seems to have been a lull in the fighting here as well, because Archer mentions okay, that, the, uh, the, that the Vorlis garrison uh, was now firing uh, from behind a barricade of their dead as well. Next slide, please. All this while, Colonel Bowles is standing up in the pulpit. The pulpit that's there today is contemporary to the time of the siege. 
Uh, he's giving orders and he's shouting out to his men, God damn his soul if he did not run his sword through him, which first called for quarter. Next slide, please. Sometime around half past two in the afternoon, um, Bowles was killed. Um, certainly he had about seven enemies around him. Whether he's killed um, by a shot uh, through the pulpit, um, I think that's got a bit of a, a biblical precedent to it, to be honest. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that on the modern uh, pulpit there, there's no mark to show that it's been shot through. Um, it's quite possible that someone has caught him from behind as either smacked him over the head with a musket butt um, or with a halberd as well. Um, but he is certainly killed. And just to emphasize that, that uh, biblical uh, precedent that the, uh, the news books seem to be taking, um, he is said to have had 15 pieces of silver in his pocket that they've looted off him uh, later on. Next slide, please. Charles I, on hearing of the death of Bowles, um, showing you know, how, uh, how high regard he is regarded uh, within the, the royalist army, uh, the king is supposed to have said, bring on me my mourning scarf. I've lost one of the best commanders in this kingdom. Next slide, please. So with Bowles death, fighting gradually receded uh, and the, the garrison, the defenders, uh, the survivors that were remaining, um, they do request quarter. And that would have been around uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, between 50 and 60 of the, uh, of the royalist defenders of the town uh, do get killed. So not a large amount, uh, but 875 are taken prisoner, including anywhere between 37 and 60 officers. Um, there's a big disparity in numbers between um, those that actually fought at the battle, uh, so the likes of Archer and what is reported in the news books as well. Um, of that number though, about 500 do change sides. Um, and there is accounts um, of, you know, the, the, the chances of a bloodbath uh, spreading uh, from the parliamentarian attackers uh, to those who survived in the church, uh, because the attackers believe that the defenders, large amounts of them, uh, may well have been Irish as well. Again, okay, it's highly unlikely. Um, looking at um, the Royalist uh, Army list uh, for 1643 and regimental list, um, there is no possibility that that, um, that uh, Bowles could have had Irish troops uh, within his army. Rather, they would have been Welsh troops that would have been taken uh, from the Welsh border uh, in and amongst Assey's regiment of foot, and uh, also the, uh, the garrison of Reading uh, as well. And uh, just to emphasize you know, how, how angsty it could have gone, um, Archer does say, we came in upon them and might have put them all to the sword. And much to do there was to keep our men from cutting them in pieces. Could they have known the Irish and that they that come out of Ireland, they had a great mind to have cut them in pieces and as turncoats. Prisoners were immediately put uh, to burying the bodies um, near the north wall of the church. Uh, and after that, uh, they would have been put to slicing the defences around the church as well, uh, either pulling them down, um, undercutting them, or if they can be destroyed, uh, blowing them up as well. Afterwards, the, uh, the prisoners were marched to Farnham in, in files of two, chained together, um, stored in Farnham Church, and then in the coming days, uh, they were paraded uh, through the streets of London as well on Waller's Victory Parade. Uh, next slide, please. Now, it, it's not as, um, as, as a piece of writing, it's, it's not as poetic as the famous War About an Enemy letter written by Hopton to Waller um, in uh, before Lansdowne Hill the, uh, earlier in the year. Uh, but certainly uh, Wadder's, uh, Hopton's dispatch to Wadder uh, in the aftermath of the storming of Alton uh, does show uh, what an impact psychologically um, this has had on Hopton. Um, there is still obviously an abiding friendship uh, between the two, um, but you know, being put on the wrong foot, you know, the first sizable defeat that Hopton has suffered um, certainly has something to play uh, possibly on uh, inducing his slowness in, in decisiveness um, the following year, possibly at Cheriton as well. Next slide, please. On the other hand, Crawford, who had escaped to Hopton uh, at the beginning of the battle, um, he, um, 
he uh, has some words to say for Waller as well. Uh, and so naturally the, um, the sack that, that had been given over um, on the 12th of December, uh, Forfa doesn't get back again as well. But, you know, there, there is, you know, um, there is a bit of, you know, in terms of, of the way he's written this letter, it is a bit like Forfa blowing raspberries at, at Waller. Um, you know, take your pick. Next slide, please. One of the fantastic things um, about the Civil War um, is that um, they recorded pretty much everything. Um, and surviving within Fury Council minutes, um, we do have claims made after the Civil War in 1660 uh, for parliamentarian soldiers uh, trying to get pensions uh, for wounds inflicted uh, during the battle. They can be divided very much into, into two parts. If we look at the rank and file soldiers who lost an arm or lost a hand and right arm, uh, probably during that, that close hand-to-hand -hand fighting, trying to get into the church, um, you're not going to get anything. Um, if you're of the rank and file, uh, chances of you getting a pension are pretty low. On the other hand, if you're an officer, and certainly this officer, um, this lieutenant in Hazarig's horse, um, who does get wounded by a pike, possibly um, as he's been chasing uh, Crawford's horse back along Lenton Lane, um, he does get uh, an award of £20 uh, and a coat of grey cloth for good measure as well. In terms of the, um, the people within the town um, whose houses and livelihoods get destroyed as a result of the fighting, they're not going to get anything good at all. They get a, a, a letter from Parliament basically saying you did well, uh, you served us gratefully, um, but they're not going to get a pension off them as well. Um, stark reminder um, of the cost um, of civil wars. Next slide, please. So what was the impact ultimately of the battle? Um, Hopton going into 1644, he is immediately shorthanded. Um, it shows how small his army is in the lead up uh, to the battle um, of Walton. Uh, in the fact that he loses half of his infantry uh, makeup as a result of the battle. He has lost a brigade um, at the fighting, uh, and as a result of this, going into the next year, he's going to be forced to conjoin with the King's Oxford army under Lord Forth uh, and go forward uh, to the Battle of Cheriton as well. In terms of the, uh, the impact for Parliament, it is certainly a morale victory uh, for Waller. Um, it proves he's still got it. He's not lost his church and he can certainly still be called uh, the Night Owl. Capitalising on his gains at Alton, uh, the days afterwards, uh, Waller advances into Sussex and besieges Alton, uh, besieges Arundel, which he retakes on the 5th of January. Um, by doing this, he immediately secures Southampton, secures that port, and also the Wild Iron Boundaries as well. And in recognition of this, on the 15th of December, uh, the House of Commons presents a letter of thanks uh, to Waller that you can see uh, narrated here as well. Next slide, please. So the battle is remembered fondly in the town uh, to this day. Uh, in recent years, there's been reenactments annually um, of the battle by the English Civil War Society, here represented by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nicholas Devereux's Regiment of Foot. Next slide, please. And indeed, in fiction, OK, the battle has been represented as well. Um, Mark Turnbull, the fantastic Civil War historian and novelist, uh, the, the climax of his, of his recent book, Allegiance of Blood, uh, takes place uh, in the storming of St. Lawrence Church as well. If you haven't gone and read that, uh, by all means, go and, and get it. OK, it's well worth a read. Next slide, please. So what has been found uh, relating to, to, to the battle? Has there been any archaeology done? Um, up to date, there's been no concerted, dedicated battle archaeology program uh, undertaken either in Alton or in St. Lawrence's church. However, during the 1865 restoration of the church, um, antiquarians did discover uh, evidence of, of potential fighting in and around the church. To start off with, they did find a ton of, of musket shot uh, embedded in the roof timbers. Um, if you can see uh, the musket shot there, a lot of them have suffered from lead decay, uh, but largely they are undeformed. Um, now, a musket ball um, 
it is quite dense. Um, I've, I've taken part in experimental firing at, at Glasgow Uni. Uh, we fired it at ballistics gel and it will pass straight through that and it'll be completely uh, undeformed. Uh, you'd have to put it under a microscope to see if you know anything's been done to that musket ball. Where we do see them flattened out and they are often identified um, as, as having hit a, hit a potential target, um, the only way that can happen is by hitting a metal surface and taking the form of that metal surface. So something like a stone wall. We've not got anything like that here. So what it's suggesting is possibly raw troops firing high. That's why these bullets are, are, are unspent, basically. As well as that, uh, on the north wall of the churchyard, um, a mass grave of bodies was discovered in 1865. Um, and this is associated with numerous buttons which is clear uh, evidence of extensive hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the vicinity of the churchyard. Now, when we're looking on battlefields, um, you always want to be looking, okay, for buttons and small change. Because if you can imagine hand-to-hand -hand fighting, what is the first piece of kit you're going to grab for? It's going to be the front of someone's jacket, uh, and, and what's going to fall out of their pockets is going to be small change, it's going to be pipe bowls, it's going to be things like that. When we're looking at any battlefield site, whether it be a siege site or an open field, um, you don't want to be looking for muskets and armor and swords. As much as we'd like to find that, um, it's going to be the first thing that's going to be nicked off that battlefield once the fighting's been finished. We are looking for broken items, items that have been dropped, items that are so small uh, that no one's going to bother about picking them up afterwards. We're looking for that needle in the haystack. Next slide, please. Now, as well as that, um, the, the, uh, the original door does survive, although it does now stand um, in the western part of the church. Um, if you go around to the south side of the church, that entrance has now been walled up. Um, that would be the entrance uh, that was fought through. As you can see, though, from the door, okay, it is completely and utterly pockmarked with bullet impacts. And if you go into the nave as well, um, there's tons of bullet scores along the walls as well. Um, which, you know, is evidence of the amount of ordnance that is fired at that church as well. And, and just for good measure, you can see um, in the bottom half of the door, the garrison has also uh, dug out a, a loophole to fire through that door through as well. So it's clear evidence of how hard and how desperate that fighting in that church must have been as well. Next slide, please. If you want to click it, oh, just click back again. And that's forward. Back again. One, two, three. That's fine. Um, as as well as that, um, I, I did get shown it right now, um, uh, or, or indeed last May. Um, they have found one piece of of, of shot uh, that was potentially fired uh, from one of those lever guns. It's about a pound in weight. It's about thirty-seven millimeters across, completely undeformed, um, and that was found again in the northern part of that churchyard as well. Now, for years, his local historians, antiquarians um, have also tried to find uh, the location of the Half Moon Battery, the earthworks surrounding uh, that church, the great work um, that was supposedly constructed on Crawford's orders on the 1st of December. Now, it's been long thought um, that um, those earthworks were destroyed, slighted in the immediate aftermath of the fighting. Um, and that may well be the case, but I think it is quite clear as well that elements of the defences probably survived uh, post-1643. Do you want to click again, James? Click again. That's the one. Um, so if we look closer at the depiction of St. Lawrence's Church uh, in Curtis's 1666 map of Alton, um, you will notice that um, there's a very vector rectilinear uh, shape around uh, the churchyard. Now, I believe um, that subsequent to the battle, um, that the earthworks, rather than being fully destroyed and sighted, were quite possibly incorporated as a boundary wall uh, into the surrounding churchyard. And, you know, Alton, if that is the case, um, this is not an isolated incident. Um, if you go to any uh, town okay, that had earthwork defences built around it, uh, so if you look at Oxford or Newark, 
um, even London, um, where these offences have been destroyed, often they've been incorporated into the modern street pattern, um, and you can trace the line of the defences uh, by looking at those um, as well. Indeed, if you go to London, next time you're in London, uh, have a look in Hyde Park or St James's Park, look at the boundary around those gardens, uh, you will see, okay, they are very, very angular. And the reason for that, okay, is they've incorporated um, the, the, the boundaries, okay, into what would have been the London defences uh, as they would have been 1643 to 1646 as well. So although they might have been pulled down uh, extensively, um, their shadow in modern planning um, is still clear to see. Next slide, please. Just click that one. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, however, amongst all of this, oh, the back one, that's fine. However, the most prominent reminder of the battle remains uh, the memorial uh, to Colonel Richard Bowles in St. Lawrence's Church. Um, or what, what his grave is in St. Lawrence's Church. Um, he was immediately buried in Winchester Cathedral, um, but there is a memorial plaque to him uh, in Orton Church to this day. Um, next slide, please. And I think, you know, if we're gonna have some closing words, um, the epitaph from his, from his, uh, from his, his memorial uh, sums it up quite well. Also, will tell you of that famous fight, which we, ye may, men, which ye man made and bade this world uh, good night. His virtuous life feared not mortality, his body might, his virtues cannot die. Because his blood was there, so nobly spent, this is his tomb, that church, his monument. Not good poetry, certainly, but certainly emphasizing uh, how important the Battle of Alton uh, certainly is. And it's something um, that we should certainly remember. It deserves to be up there with Cheriton and, and other battles of the Civil War as well. Next slide, please. And one more slide. All that's left to say is if I have enlightened, entertained and educated you this evening and you would like to hear more about the Civil War uh, in Hampshire, uh, I will be coming down the country uh, in May. Uh, on the 4th of May, we'll be doing a walk uh, around the defences of Basing as well. Um, Basing House, um, one of the focal points of the Civil War in the South, uh, besieged three, if not four times as well. Uh, and indeed, uh, after the fighting at Naseby in, in June 1645, it is one of the last remaining royalist strongholds uh, to fall as well. Uh, in terms of its defences, they are extensive, um, they are well preserved, uh, and in terms of a story, you can't get much dramatic uh, a telling of the Civil War. Um, you've got closet Catholics, you've got, um, you've got botanists, you've got uh, Dutch classical artists in there. It is a microcosm of, of 17th century life and culture as well. Uh, and certainly as well as that, you know, it, it deserves to be remembered as well. It's certainly been uh, the focus of Jesse Child's recent book um, that's been in all the top seller book lists of the Siege of Loyalty House. Um, and it's certainly, if you need to know something about the Civil War in Hampshire, um, Basing House is the one to go on. So hopefully see uh, more of you in May, um, but thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions? If you would like to unmute yourself and ask away any questions, um, I've only got one really question, um, uh, Warwick. I saw that uh, uh, in one of the posters, Alton was in Surrey. When did all that happen? Um, I think it's, it, well, it may well, I've never heard of it being on Surrey. Um, I've always considered it Hampshire, but it is so close to the Surrey border as well. You know, it, I think it's probably debatable. Yeah, they just may have got it wrong. <laughs> Tim, have you got a question? Uh, I have indeed. Um, just to, uh, again, it's kind of, I was intrigued when you were talking about finds in a churchyard. Yes. Uh, Warwick. Um, so having spent various times in churchyards myself and uh, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to going to Acton Church at Nantwich Fantastic. because um, there there's bullet damage on Acton Church. Oh, it's covered. It's absolutely mm. covered, Acton. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's good. 
Um, because you see a lot of holes on buildings, and people say, Oh, that's bullet. Damage. Yeah, you're not sure that whether it's bullet damage or not. Um, so <clears throat> I can see that in the course of time, certainly when people are digging graves or, or when they're modifying the church or, or when they're doing foundation work or whatever, there'll be a reason to, to dig. Um, but I think you were indicating there was some planned archaeological dig. At, uh... I, think, I think it's, it's a case of. Uh as they're doing these renovations okay naturally right. they're, they're putting a trench in there anyway there's been an antiquarian amongst them and he's recorded them uh, i think it's more by chance um than than, than anything else um I, I don't think it was planned it was more a case it was a, a happy byproduct that they identified this mass grave rather than it being a, a, a planned antiquarian dig there um if if it was an antiquarian dig um it may well be like every other antiquarian dig in that they take lots of the finds go that's lovely. I'll give it to all my friends, and that's why we've not got anything, you know, mm. freely available mm. for for the battle. But yes, um, I, I don't think it was it was a planned thing. I think it was more of a case of they found these bodies both in the antiquarian, and he said, "Oh yes, um, that directly uh, relates to the battle." Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more for any more, <clears throat> Maggie? Do you have any questions or? Uh, I got a question, if I may, please, James. Yeah, please do, Charles. Thanks. Um, Warwick, the, your map showed um, the armies moving around the very large parts of uh, current Hampshire and Sussex. Yes. But what was the sort of rate of advance or rate speed of movement they could achieve? You know. I think if you're if you're going at a, at a belt, if you're if you're trying to get in contact with someone, they they are it is possible that they're doing up to 20, 22 miles a day. Um, I think that's the ideal rather than rather than the reality. Um, it also depends um, as well if, if they're being harried along the march as well, and and um, supplies that they need to get in contact with as well. Um, naturally, okay, if the army is, is not being well supplied, it's going to go slower um, than if it is being well supplied. But certainly, if you are marching to contact, if you are expecting to find a battle, top range is about 20 miles. In reality, you're doing eight, nine miles in a day at the very most. And did they have a sort of fairly extensive baggage train or did they... Uh... Like, Not for Walton, no. I, I think it, it, it very much Waller's plan for Walton is it to be a smash and grab, get in there as quickly as possible. And not only that, okay, he's he's 10 miles away from Farnham. He doesn't need a baggage train um, at Alton. Um, he's, he's well within range to supply his army. Whereas if you are going from an area you control into an enemy area, expecting to fight a battle, you probably would have a baggage train with you as well. And, and one of the abiding... Um, problems with, with civil war armies is that um, one side's cavalry will, will charge in, uh, defeat the other side's cavalry, and then rather than you know, being recalled to be used again, they charge straight in and they go after the baggage train as well. Um, that's, that's for much larger armies, and certainly, you know, Waller has no, no need for a baggage train at, at Alton. Um, he's, he's, he's marching, marching hard and fast minimal supplies as possible. Great, thanks a lot. Much appreciated. Super talk, thanks. Thank you. Any more questions, Maggie? No, not for you. Jonathan, have you got any questions? No, I haven't. It was, it was really, really interesting. Warwick, just to say thank you very, very much. Uh, Pleasure, thank you. Hope to come along to the uh, Basing House uh, a tour as well, but it was super. Please do, thank you. Good. Well, there's a couple of people. There's uh, Clay's coming uh, on the walk as well, so that would be, that'd be good. And uh, yeah, well, yeah, just... absolutely. This is uh, this is Clay, and I'm uh, sorry that I've got to log off. I've got to go put two small children to bed, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I'm going to save all of my questions for May. <laughs> please do, please do. I said, you know. The, the, you know, I, I've got to talk about medieval battles, okay, all week, okay, and, and it does your head in, okay. The, the Civil War is where it at. The Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Pleasure. 
<clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Warwick. That was an excellent talk. Um, if there's no more questions, um, I'm going to draw everything to a close. And um, uh, see you next month. I think the next person talking is uh, our friend Tim, who is uh, uh, talking on um, Bletchley Park. Uh, so uh, we look forward to that. Um, but in the meantime, keep safe and uh, uh, I'll see you uh, next month. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye-bye.